Hello, this is Doug Rumba, and welcome to episode two in my introduction to web hosting. In the last episode, we purchased a domain name, and now in this episode, we are going to set up our server to link to that domain name. First things first, I do need to define the word server because there is a confusing aspect to this word in that it can be used to refer to two quite different things. The word server can be used to describe either a computer, a physical computer, or the word server can be used to describe a piece of software running on the computer. When we say web server, we're actually referring kind of simultaneously to two very different things. We're referring to A, a computer, and B, a piece of software. So we are going to be renting a virtual server, which is a computer, a virtual machine. And then into that virtual server, we will be installing and configuring a web server, which is a piece of software running in the virtual server that allows us to serve web pages. As a first step, we need to provision our virtual server. Now, in principle, you can use any computer you want for this, as long as you have a way of exposing it to the internet with some sort of a static IP address. However, exposing computers on your home network to the internet is a security nightmare, not to mention potentially against the terms of service that you sign with your ISP. A lot of residential ISP contracts don't allow you to technically run applications out of your home. Uh, that requires a commercial uh, contract. It's generally not that good of an idea to do this from home unless you know what you're doing. So we're going to be using a virtual server from a cloud hosting provider instead. Now I am going to be using RamNode here because RamNode is just the one that I use. Uh, there are of course any number of them azure aws linode rackspace digitalocean there's a ton of different providers that all do this same thing so feel free to shop around and find the one that meets your needs for the lowest cost we're not actually going to need that much in the way of resources to do this as we'll see so i'm going to go ahead and just create a new instance for RamNode. now one thing to note is that you will often have a bunch of different choices here. They These providers really do throw a huge amount of options at you. For example, here for RamNode, I have a couple different kinds of KVMs, and I also have this, uh, this VDS as well. Now, you wanna be careful in that for what we're doing right now, the process that I'm using, we want a virtual machine, we want a virtual server, not a container or not a hosted application or anything like that. The key word to look for is KVM, that's kernel virtual machine. If you rent a KVM, that typically means that you're renting the full virtual machine and not just a container or allow hosting an application or doing a file storage or something like that. So keyword KVM is what you wanna look for. And I'm just gonna go for the cheapest one Web hosting, especially if you're hosting like a personal website or something where you're not, let's be honest, you're not expecting an, a large amount of traffic. And especially if your website is static, that is to say it's it's simply HTML and it doesn't have like a backend database and all kinds of complicated stuff. This is not necessarily a computationally intensive process. So it it's probably worth it to just start at the low end and then you can always upgrade later. Usually these providers make it very easy to uh, spend more money if you want to spend more money <laughs> without having to really change much of anything. So I'm gonna start on the bottom end. Now, as far as the boot sources, I'm going to be using OpenBSD as the operating system for my virtual server. Now, the reason for this is because OpenBSD ships with a special web server, HTTPD, that I really like for this sort of thing because it's very simple. The two big web servers in the Linux space are Apache and Nginx. 
And then of course on Windows you have IIS. The web server is the program on the virtual server that sits there, gets the requests for data, figures out what file that corresponds to, and sends the file back out again. HTTPD on OpenBSD is really simple. It's dead simple to configure. And I really like that. It's generally speaking a good practice to try to use the simplest tool that you can to accomplish the job that you're trying to accomplish. HTTPD does not have the same feature set that Apache or Nginx or IIS has. However, it does have sufficient features to meet most of your needs or all of your needs if all you're doing is hosting a personal static website or something. And because it doesn't have all those extra features, it's much easier to configure properly. It's much less likely for you to misconfigure it and leave yourself vulnerable to all kinds of strange attacks. And it's just generally safer to use. And it also means that you can reasonably expect that you'll be able to understand a lot about how it works without investing a huge amount of time. Because let's be honest here, I'm not a sysadmin, I'm a programmer. You're probably not a sysadmin. So is it really worth your time to spend a week or two really learning Apache when you could get all you needed to do done with a far simpler solution and then spend your time elsewhere, right? So I'm going to be using OpenBSD HTTPD. And of course, if you want to follow along with me, you'll, you will have to do the same. Uh, in any case, we'll go ahead, get this machine stood up. You should set up SSH keys. We are going to do that, but I'm not going to do it here because I want to show you the full process for generating and copying them over. So although you probably should add SSH keys here on the creation screen, um, I'm not going to do that. We'll do that manually in just a moment. All right, and we'll create and boot. This will take a moment and then we will be right back. And we're back. So you can see it says booted from. Now, the way that most of these are going to work is whenever you start the thing up with an ISO is it's going to just boot to that ISO, uh, which means that there's actually an installer that's running. So I'm not going to be able to just access this at the specified IP address and, and roll with it. I am going to have to um, run the install script first. So I'm going to have to start by accessing the, the VNC console here. And I'd imagine most of your provi cloud providers are probably going to do the same thing. Now, from here, we simply run through the installation process. I'm basically going to just default everything. Um, the defaults are, are perfectly fine. If you want to spend some time reading on how best to optimally configure the OpenBSD and things like that. Tons of resources out there. For now, that's not my priority. So let's just run through the defaults. We're gonna do I for install. And then default keyboard layout for my host name. I'm gonna call it uh, video SVR, video server. VIO, we're going to do DHCP on IPv4, nothing on IPv6, sorry. And this, so I do not believe that this is going to really have any influence on the, um, the web hosting process. It basically just gets stuck on the end of the host name we put there. So my computer's actual host name here is going to be video server dot whatever I do. But I'm going to go ahead and throw in my douglasrumball.xyz domain, which is the domain I'm going to be binding to this thing. Specify our root password. You do want to start SSH by default. You do not expect to run the X window system. This is a server, not a desktop. Not going to change the default console. Now, user. We do, in fact, want to set up a user account. On in Linux -y circles, right, it's common practice to not run as root on your desktop. Well, if it's common practice to not use root as your main account on your desktop computer, 
on, then imagine how important it is not to do that on a server. So I'm going to set up a user called Doug, and we're going to be using Doug to do most of the work. Do not ever, under any circumstance, allow root login via SSH. And then I'm going to simply run through the, um, the default disk partitioning, default set location, da, da, da. this is just determining the, um, specifying the files that we're going to install. I'm going to continue without verification. All right, um, we're done here. Ah, <laughs> I'm not in Canada Mountain Dime. I am in, I believe it's, whoa, US Eastern. Yes. Okay, and now we are ready. So we can go ahead and reboot. Uh, however, there's a good chance that it's going to reboot back to the disk. You can see it's booting from the CD rather than um, rebooting to the, the hard drive, the actual operating system that we installed. So I'm gonna go ahead and close out of this console, come back here, and I'm going to unmount ISO and reboot. Whatever VPS provider you're using probably has an option similar to that. And then we can open the console up on that, and we should now be booting to the actual, the actual disk. And we're in. So let's go ahead and sign in as root here. Now, before we start getting into setting up the web server itself, we should do a couple of general server maintenance things. First things first is we don't want to be running root. We want to be running that user account that we created. And beyond that, we don't want to be running in the virtual console here. I would like to SSH in. So we're going to do a couple of configuration tweaks to get SSH working. SSH in is my user account and then do some general setup from there. And then we'll be ready to proceed to setting up the website. I know there's a million and one steps to do before you can actually get to the fun stuff, but that's just the the world of uh, <laughs> server administration, I suppose. So SSH configuration is located in slash etc slash SSH. And if we take a look at the contents, sshd underscore config. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the, the Unix conventions here, the D is short for daemon or daemon, um, depending on how you want to pronounce it, diamond perhaps. <laughs> that AE actually is, an, in, at least in Latin, it's an I sound, although the word daemon or demon here is Greek. I don't know what, how that's pronounced that way, but irrelevant. What that means is basically server. It's a background program that runs. So SSH is the client. It's the program we use to connect to a remote server. And SSHD is the daemon that runs on the server that our SSH client connects up to. So if we want to configure the server to connect to the server, we need to edit sshd config. So let's go ahead and do that. Our default text editor is vi. So we'll just use that. If you're, from, if you're more familiar with say nano, um, that's not installed by default, neither is vim or pretty much anything. vi is, well, okay, ed. Ed is the standard Unix text editor. Oh no, how do I quit? There we go. <laughs> uh, ed is the standard Unix text editor, but uh, VI is the conventional standard Unix text editor at this point. As a side note, it occurs to me that I am assuming that you know how to use VI, and that may not be the case. If you don't know how to use VI, you can install and use Nano instead. So. Package add, we'll see this in just a moment when we go to install sudo. Uh, package add is the package manager for installing packages. Go figure. So if you do a package add nano, that will go ahead and install the nano text editor on the system. Uh, the other thing you're gonna have to do is we use vsudo in a moment, which is going to default to the default editor, which is vi. So in order for 
in order for vsudo to pick up nano instead, you're going to have to export editor equals nano like that. And then vsudo will launch with the appropriate text editor. So again, if you don't know VI or you aren't comfortable with VI, at this point, do a package add nano followed by followed by an export editor equals nano and then proceed as normal replacing all calls to VI with nano. Uh, now VI is actually a bit of a pain in the butt to use if you're used to Vim because some of your muscle memory is not going to quite pan out. Uh, one thing to be aware of is if you're if you're using remapping if you're remapping keys on your computer like I do, I, I flip escape and caps lock uh, just using GNOME tweaks. It's going to cause you a hell of a time on this stupid VNC thing because it just doesn't quite work. So you may want to go through at this point before we start diving into the VI text editor and change that. In fact, I'm going to do that right now. And just quick disable that for the moment. Once we get into SSH, then we can turn all of our keyboard remapping goodness back on again. But as long as we're in this VNC, it can cause a bunch of problems. Okay, so now we can edit our SSHD config. There's a couple of things we're gonna wanna do in here. Well, there's one major thing we're gonna wanna do in here, which is we wanna make sure that password authentication is enabled for the moment. Uh, so just delete that comment and get on out of there. We are going to be disabling it explicitly shortly, but for our first step here, we need to make sure that it is enabled. So now that we've edited the con configuration file, we have to restart the service. OpenBSD does not use systemd, it uses RC and it scripts. So rcctl is the command that we are going to use to configure our services. So we're going to do an rcctl restart sshd, and that will restart ssh. So we should be good to go there. OpenBSD also does not include sudo by default. It uses something called do as instead, which does pretty much the same thing. But if you're more familiar with sudo and you would like sudo, we may as well just install it. It's not super complicated. So package underscore add is the package manager for OpenBSD. So we can do a package add sudo and it will present us with a couple of options to install. We want the first one. So just type, well, the first one that's not none. So just type number one and we'll get that installed. And now of course we need to edit the configuration file to make sure that our user has sudo privileges. If you do an ls on slash home, if you forgot what your username was that you could set up when you installed it, it's Doug. So we're gonna go vsudo, which is again going to launch in the VI text editor. And we can go on down and configure this. Okay, so now we theoretically have sudo configured as well. So we can attempt to SSH into our server at this point. We're gonna need our IP address, which is ifconfig. And here, 107.191.98.187, that is our IP address. So at this point, we can come back to our, our desktop computer here and let's try SSH and into this thing. So the way that this works is you do SSH username at, and if your, if your computer username is the same as your server username, you actually don't, you don't need the dug at, you can just type the IP address. And then we need to, well, type the IP address. So it's a 107.191.98.187. Just like that. Uh, this is this pops up whenever you have not yet connected to this computer. So if I've never connected to the server before, I'm gonna get this. Don't worry about it. 
just say yes. Now, if if this pops up again in the future, that could potentially indicate that somebody is trying to man in the middle you, but that that's pretty unlikely. Um, now, we type in the user password we created on the install, and welcome to OpenBSD. Great, so SSH is working. Let's quick test sudo by doing a, uh, a package add. Um, let's package add vim. And there's a million different versions of vim, apparently. Which one do I want? <laughs> this is a good question. Uh, vim no x11. Let's go with 10. Seems kind of silly to install a GTK version of Vim when there's no no X11. Okay, good. Vim's working. Great. Uh, and now, now that we're into SSH land, we can, if you want, if you if you disable any key bindings before, uh, you can go ahead and put them back on now, and we'll be in uh, we'll be in good shape. Okay, so now let's get away from password authentication. Password-based authentication is in many ways suboptimal. So if you're SSH into a server, uh, you can just type exit and that will close the connection. Be careful. Don't ask me how I know this. And make sure that you actually exit enough times to get out, because if I if I launch a couple of shells and then maybe switch over into root using sue, right? When I type exit, this is going to quit sue. This is going to quit one of those shells. This is going to quit one of those shells, and then that finally closes out. Make sure that you're exited all the way out and not just out of one shell. You don't want to think you're on your laptop and issue a shutdown command and then realize that you were actually still connected to the server and you just shut down the server and have to walk across the street to power it back on again. Yeah, sorry Ricky. Anywho, uh, let's set up public key encryption for SSH next. So fairly straightforward to do. We just have to run two commands in a row. Now, the first command is SSH keygen, and this is going to generate your public and private key. Uh, so the way this works is it's based on RSA encryption. I'm not going to talk about the details of how that works. Uh, basically, there are two keys. There's one which you keep private and don't share with anyone, and then there's one that you can share publicly. And then when you combine both keys together, you can verify your identity and do a variety of other stuff like that. So we're going to generate a public and a private key. Then we're going to upload the public key to the server. Then when I make an SSH connection, I can check the public key with my private key, make sure that everything works out, and then be allowed in. And this is more secure than passwords because these key pairs are significantly longer and more obscure than a password, among other things. So the default location is perfectly fine. Um, my, I already have one, so I'm just going to overwrite it. Now, this passphrase is used to unlock the file locally on your computer. You technically should use one, but I usually don't. Uh, make of that what you will. In any case, we now have our uh, public keys created. So we have uh, public key is idrsa.pub, private key is idrsa. A, you want to keep the R, the the not dot pub one private, and then that one's your public. Okay, so now that we have the keys generated, we need to copy the public key over. You can do this manually, but there is a command for that too. It's ssh uh, copy id, and then you simply copy id and you do the same. Um, in fact, let me just do it this way, like that copy ID and then user at IP address. 
it is going to prompt you for the password to sign in, which is why we couldn't disable password authentication earlier. And now that we have the keys copied over, if I do my SSH command, you'll notice no password, I just drop right in because it used public key authentication instead. So now that that's done, we can actually go in and take out, disable fully password-based authentication. So we're gonna run through here and I'm gonna explicitly allow public key authentication, although it's yes by default, as we just saw. And then I'm going to explicitly disable password authentication. And now we can do a sudo rcctl restart sshd like so. And theoretically we should be in good shape. So if I just do a straight SSH like that, permission denied, it didn't allow us to type in a password. Good, so I believe we are in good shape now. Oop. Actually, I wanna be in there. There we go. Okay, so finally ready to do our uh, install and set up our web server, right? Uh, unfortunately not. There, the next thing we we're gonna to wanna to do is make sure that our system is fully up to date. There are two things that we have to do to fully update the system. We're gonna to have to update BSD itself and then update the packages. So the package is pretty straightforward. Actually, they're both pretty straightforward. Uh, but if you do a package add tack u, that's sort for update. This is gonna run through and update all of the installed packages on the system. When you have a web server like this, it is very important that everything remain as up to date as possible. You do not want to be running an older version of software that has some vulnerabilities in it. So this package update will, or package add tack u will update all the packages that we installed. And then to actually update the core BSD system, we need to run, there's a utility called syspatch for this. So if I run sys, syspatch tack c, this is going to identify all of the security patches that need to be applied. As you can see, there are a couple. <laughs> and then once you run syspatch tack c, just run syspatch with nothing, and this should install all of those security patches. Okay, good to go. Uh, and now it says reboot to load new kernel. We better do that. So go ahead and reboot, which is going to, of course, kick us off of our <laughs> SSH session. So we'll wait a little bit and try to SSH back into it. And so that I think brings us to a good closing point for this video. In the next video, we will take a look at linking our server to our domain name that we purchased in the first video. And then we'll take a look after that at configuring the web server to actually get web pages loading. So that's the game plan. I hope that you found this interesting and I'll, uh, I'll see you over in the next episode.